Today, I'm getting back to our series from the first letter of John the Apostle, the results of God's love as shown in so many ways in John's testimony and encouragement. We've noticed both the tenderness and the direct practicality of John in this message. Today, as we go to the scripture once again, we'll find that John is going to be very direct about what our behavior says about how we value the work of God in our lives. It is by grace we are saved because we can't pay the price for our salvation. That is never different than true. Only Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was able to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice for the sin of humanity, for my sin, for your sin. That is the atonement for sin that we accept by recognizing we're guilty, surrendering ourselves to God, who loves us so much, he sent his one and only son so that we might be saved. So we surrender, repenting of our own sin, asking for our sin to be forgiven in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. God answers our surrender with the perfect judgment of grace, his undeserved favor to us, and creates life in us where sin had wrought only death. Here's St. Paul's short-term statement of what God has done for us in Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6. When the time came to completion, God sent his own son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It's the Aramaic way of saying daddy. It's the Aramaic of saying, my precious father, Papa. If we're sincere in our confession, God is faithful through the grace of Jesus Christ to forgive us. We're born again, born anew as the children of God. Our hearts washed clean and our souls reset to give glory to God, our Father, every day of our lives. At least that's how it's supposed to work for us. Jesus died once for all our sin so that the penalty of hell is satisfied. Now we're responsible for our daily living so that we are behaving like God's children. We're responsible for our daily living. There's so much in scripture that tells us what it means to be righteous to do what is right, that it should be very clear to us that we cannot ignore our deeds and misdeeds. Although we're saved by grace, our behavior matters to God. It matters a great deal. The question is this, are you living a life that looks like you are behaving like a child of God? Do others see in you a bent toward heaven or a bent toward hell? Do you love the world more than you love God? Is your selfish stubbornness preventing you from submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit in you to lead you into holiness in all you do? That's the question. But pastor, I'm not saved by works. Only Jesus can offer salvation. I can't save myself. And that's right. You can't save yourself. I already said so. But I'm reading scripture and finding that it says a lot about how we should behave as God's children, as part of the family. So keep asking yourself, Is my life bringing any glory to God? Does it look like I value the cost of my salvation? So let's talk again about being God's children. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, as the nature of Christ Jesus is described and the reality of Jesus coming to earth, the Son of God, there is a choice, that is, of receiving or rejecting Jesus for who he really is. That choice remains with us today. Many still reject Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of mankind, the Lord of life. But John writes this in John 1, 12 of the Gospel of John. But to all who did receive him, he gave the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in his name. To all who did receive him, he gave the right to be children of God. Because of belief in his name. See, our salvation is not by works. It is by grace, which comes through faith. Yet what we do 
matters to God. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Born not of flesh and blood, but born of the spirit of God. Born again as the child of God. It's so important that we see ourselves as God's children. Because it's only when we see ourselves as the children of God that it becomes important for us to honor God, our Father, with how we behave, to bring honor to God. So settle into the reality of the new birth that God has done for you. We have to look again to the theme verse when it comes to being God's children. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Now, that's a Christian standard Bible, which I've been using in this series. The NIV says it this way in 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished upon us. I love that word in the NIV. Overdone more than necessary, just poured it out. How great is the love that he has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. That's very important that we see ourselves as that. See how great the love the Father has given us, that in Christ it is love that births us. Not just human eroticism, pressed on by hormones, but godly design that wants us to experience the very best of God's purposes for us as his children. Love always does what is best for the one who is loved, no matter the cost. That's God's image of loving us. He does what is best for us. It wasn't good for Jesus to hang on the cross, but it was good for us. It wasn't good for God the Father to see his son on the cross, but it was good for us. Love does what is good for the one who is loved, no matter the cost. And God proved it through Jesus Christ. It shows us that God loves us so much. There isn't anything he wouldn't do to have us as his eternal spiritual children. That's why the cross of Jesus should always remind us of God's love more than our sin. For it is love that nailed Jesus to the cross. It's God's love for even we sinners. It shows the price God is willing to pay for our souls. It's the cost of our sin, so don't take grace for granted. That's why we can see that it is our goal to imitate Jesus, so that we are becoming more than children. See, your mama didn't birth you into this world so you can stay a baby. None of that wears off after just a few months of dirty diapers and sleepless nights and worry about parenthood. We're born to mature, first as newborns, then teetering toddlers, then wide-eyed, hopeful children, then young students, then tweeners and teenage, and then young adults, and moving on. That does not change the fact of whose child we are, but it does change how we live out our lives. We can't live our lives the same when we are 20 as we did when we are 10. We can't live the lives the same as when we are 15 as we did when we were five. It just makes no sense to not mature in who we are. So that's why the scripture even talks about there is more than just being a newborn child of God. My son and daughter are in their late 40s. In fact, our son Micah will turn 50 next year. But the fact remains, he is our child and always will be. Our daughter Sarah is our child and always will be. You are God's child and always will be. Now, John knows this in terms of growing up as faithful people. And he writes in verse 2 of 1 John 3, Dear friends, we are God's children now. Listen to this, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. What we will be, that's the goal we have not yet realized. That's what's ahead of us. John speaks of it as a revelation because it's not up to us to design it. It's up to God to show it to us. And some of us have experienced it. God has shown us something 
entirely different than what we ever expected for our lives as we grow and mature and put ourselves in his hand to serve him. We can know what we will be if we are God's children now and remain so. We will, as sisters and brothers of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, John says, grow up to be like him. And John adds an important because. Because we will see him as he is. You see, that's one of our issues when it comes to honoring God in our lives. We don't actually see God for who he is. We don't actually see the Son of God for who he is. Reduced him to less than what we should. Yes, Jesus became fully human. He got dust between his toes as he walked the streets and the roads of Palestine in his sandals. He had to wash his feet when he got home. He had to wash his face and wash his hands before he ate. Same as us, nothing different. He needed to eat and drink while he was on this earth. Same as us, nothing different. But in his actions and his behavior, he always knew whose child he really was. He knew he was the son of God most high. And he acted in righteous ways through all his life. But you see, for us, we haven't quite captured the majesty and glory of the risen Lord who sits at the right hand of the Father on high. We cannot and do not know him now in that way. We will not truly know him until we have our spiritual eyes opened wide by the wonder of his return as the Lord of life and Lord of all. But we can begin to try to see it just by trying to understand that that's who he is. He is given the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a majesty verse. And that is, should be a verse of our daily living. That's our goal. But the goal is still ahead. The finish line has not been crossed. No matter how many laps we have run, we aren't done until we're done. In the meantime, it's important that we are at least beginning to behave like God's child. Yes, I said at least beginning to behave like God's child because we're always growing more into that. We spend so much of our lives and so much of our focus on behaving like others. Our heroes are seldom the saints and more likely a celebrity, sometimes a politician or an athlete. If we're thoughtful, we can see past the angst of our daily lives. We can see some better heroes in the saints of God whom we have encountered who show us a better way to live and honor of God. John writes in 1 John 3.3, 3, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. There's the beginning step. There's the beginning step to beginning to behave like God's child. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We need to start clean. And that starts with a clean confession. And then once we've done that, we seek the Lord's purity and the Lord's cleansing day after day after day. So we have met some of those who because of the hope of heaven and the gift of salvation have made it a point to live a pure and holy life. As much as they are able, as much as they recognize the spirit inside these mortal bodies, and as much as that spirit is allowed to rule. It might be a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or a friend or a professor or a grandparent, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, even a brother or sister or a neighbor whom we look up to as a model of what it looks like to live by hope, to be led by God with a pure heart and an intention to honor God the Father. That's going to look different for each of us but it will be evident to others if we do it well. That's what being a child of God should look like. John says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our brother in the family of God, is pure. So how then should we behave? Paul wrote in Ephesians Chapter 5, first couple of verses there. Therefore, be imitators 
of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Wow. Imitators of God walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. John speaks of purifying ourselves so that we might become like Jesus. Paul goes a step farther saying we are to be imitators of God. The context is love. It's always love. Actually, if you pay attention in the Bible, walk in love as Christ loved us. Jesus Christ, the son of the most high God, walked the earth knowing his life was not his own. He knew that love demanded sacrifice of his will to the will of God the Father and to the needs of God's children. And so he became a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God for our salvation. I hope your soul says, wow, again. See how much love the Father has for us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Now let's keep on with our theme because behaving has a very simple rule. As we're back to behaving, what does it mean to behave? Come on, we all know the answer to that one. It's clear, really. And it should be clear. We either say and do what we're supposed to or we don't. Behaving is, has a very simple rule. If our parents are faithful to their task, it's clear there is a way of being good and a way of being guilty. Now, some parents have given up on parenting. That's way too bad because us kids need it. Us kids need active parenting. We need somebody to look us in the eye and say, you cannot do that. We need someone to bring us around back and say, let's see if we can correct this problem we have here. We need someone to help us know what is right and what is wrong because We have a problem, and John puts it plainly as a simple rule. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. Well, there you have it. The one who does what is right is righteous, but the problem is behind it. It's not so hard to understand that the one who does what is right is righteous, so doing what is right helps us to behave in a righteous manner. That's behaving as God's children, as we should. Yet John starts that sentence with, let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Disobedience or bad behavior has a root in deception. Deception that our lives are only ours to live. And I don't have to pay attention to my parents. I don't have to pay attention to the rules of the road. I don't have to pay attention to the civil rules that surround me. I don't have to pay attention to what I'm supposed to do. I only get to do what I want to do, right? You know, car's driving down the sidewalk. Well, it's his car. Let him drive where he wants, right? No, it's not the way it works. We have a responsibility to behave as doing what is right. There's that deception that my desires are more important than God's designs. The deception that I'm alive for my own good only, and I have to watch out for myself only. The deception that I deserve something that I am not supposed to have. The deception is always trying to pull us away from what is right. Bad behavior has its roots in the simple selfishness of sin. No more, no less. We see also in John's writing, Bad behavior is also a very simple manner. Good behavior is doing what is right. So bad behavior is doing what is not right. Okay. Simple. You do that. I'm certainly not preaching anything new today. I'm making sure we attach this to what it means to live like the children of God. What is not right is sin. Sin is sin. Don't be deceived. It can't be disguised. It is sin. It's not self-fulfillment. It's not personal gain. It's not fame. It's not luxury. It's not being held in high in someone else's eyes. If it is not what is right, it is sin. And John is clear in 1 John 3, 8. The one who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. 
Now that gets pretty sharp, but it's pretty important to be clear about what is clear. Now, I had preached on a paragraph that I just bounced over several weeks ago when I talked about knowing God. And 1 John 3, 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. The rules The guidelines, the reality is short and sweet and simple. The one who commits sin is of the devil. A sinner is behaving like their father, the devil, as Jesus put it. And the devil doesn't know any other way of behaving. He's been against God's program from the beginning. Love makes him cringe and obedience is a bad word. It's the devil that tempted Adam and Eve to sin. And they had only one rule to obey because they hadn't thought of anything else yet. They had one rule to obey, but the devil tempted them to sin. It was the devil who taught and tempted Cain to commit the first murder. It's the devil who teaches and continues to tempt us with lies and deceit about what we might gain if only we'll follow the sinful behavior of the son of perdition, the enemy of God, the devil. And we have an image of that in the first parts of the Gospels as Jesus is tempted in his 40 days of putting himself before the Lord God. He's tempted with fame. He's tempted with riches. He's tempted with power. And every time he says, you know what? God gets the glory, not me. Now, the devil can promise a lot in this world, but it's not the applause of the world that we need. It's not being on top of the business world or the church or the political world or exercising power over people for our own ends. The devil can grant us Much of that because he'd been practicing since the beginning. But the Son of God was revealed to destroy the devil's works. To destroy sin, not sinners. The devil is the image of sin, but in God's eyes, sinners are to be saved. In God's eyes, we are loved. And that's what it means to see The devil's works destroyed to break the power of sin, to be set free from sin so that we can behave like the saved children of God. That's what it means, destroying the devil's work, breaking the power of sin, letting God have rule and way in our lives so we can behave like the saved children of God. Yet in the practical sense, we still struggle with that. It shouldn't be so, but it is. God gives us a bit of his own righteousness, though, to help us with our unrighteousness. And so here it is. Here's the key to behaving like God's children. The key comes from a new life in Christ. The key comes from being born again, being born of God. And as John tells us, not just being born of God, but There's something else here that we see in 1 John 3, 9. Everyone who's been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he's been born of God. Now, it's the remain I want you to see in that verse. His seed remains in him. In him. If we open our hearts and give God a place and let that spirit settle in and let the seed of the Holy One be growing something new inside us, it'll blossom into something wonderful on the outside. That's the key to behaving like God's children, not trying harder, but living out what God has poured in, not trying to live in what we experience on the outside, but live out what God has done for us on the inside. John says, everyone who's been born of God does not sin. That's the key to behaving like God's children is truly to be born again. We talk about that over and over. It's part of our endless theme in the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you must be born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. We have to be born into that life through the blessing and the seed of God. And John says, when we've been born of God, 
we don't sin. The righteousness of God and the evil of sin don't live together in the same little pocket. It's one or the other. Because the righteousness of God is light that blasts away the darkness of sin. And that light that blasts away that darkness means they cannot abide the two in the same place. If we will allow that spirit of God to settle into us, that seed of God to be planted in our hearts, that new birth to to start from the inside and work its way out, then John actually says he's not able to sin because he'd been born of God. Now, be careful with that verse. Don't take it as an automatic reality. If you ask God about your next step, if you seek God's pleasure for your next step, if you know what is right and what is wrong, then it is what you choose to do. Are you going to choose that seed of righteousness that's in you to rule your behavior? Or will you allow that bit of sin that has been pressed in from the outside to take over? Holiness happens when the Holy Spirit of God takes over in our lives. The Holy Spirit cannot sin. We are not able to sin when we're acting according to the Holy Spirit, but it's not automatic. It happens because we've been born of God. It happens because the Holy Spirit is there, but we have to pay attention to what voice we listen to. For ultimately, it's easy to see who's behaving like God's child, because since the rules are simple, the outcome is also clear. It's easy to see who's behaving like God's child because the one who's behaving like God's child is starting to look more and more like a bit of Jesus in this world. Did you know the name Christian means little Christ? Did you know the name Christian means that you are echoing Christ in your life? what you do. Christian should not be just a label or a check mark on a form. Christian should be what your life looks like because of Christ inside. And John puts it this way in 1 John 3.10, this is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. Now, John goes into a lot uh, more about loving our brother and sister at the end of chapter two and into chapter four. And I do have another uh, message we'll be sharing from that later on. This has so much clarity in this verse. It's not hidden. It's not a mystery. It's not funny language. It's not big words. It's just plain. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God. You knew that anyway, didn't you? So how is your behavior shaping up to that reality? How is your life shaping up to that reality? How is your love shaping up to that reality? Who did become your enemy because of the enemy of your souls? Who has lost your love because you've been tempted away from what God wants. For each of us, behaving like a child of God means that we imitate Christ. It means that whoever has this hope in him, as Paul wrote, um, that I read earlier, whoever has this hope in him will live according to what God desires. God sent the Son so that we might be his. He gave us his spirit so we might know what God wants from us. Now, we don't yet know what we're going to look like in 10 years, 30 years, 50 years. We don't have any idea of how God sees us most of the time. I want you to know that he sees you always with his eyes of love. Even when a sinner, he sees you as someone who needs saved. He loves you no matter what. But when you honor him, you prove that you are his child. Let us pray together.
and begin to seek the Lord once again for his power in our lives. Father, you are God. We realize and recognize that and we honor you for that. And yet, because the spirit you've poured into your children, we can also cry out, Abba, Papa. We can cry out to you knowing that you hear us as beloved children. And Lord, we cry out to you because we are sinners in need of a savior. We cry out to you because our lives need the power of the Holy Spirit. We cry out to you because we would rather be on your side than on the devil's side. And yet we've been blinded to what that means. Father, that our eyes be open and our hearts be made pure. That is our prayer today. So, Father, call us to yourself and do a new work in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.